Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I welcome you all to our Zoom platform today to hear a great dermatologist at Fakhi University, as well as our own homeopathic friend, Dr. Alim. And we have the privilege of having Dr. Manoj Patel from the Avli Institute to join us on our forum today. I call upon Dr. Aarti to take over the platform and talk about the importance and relevance of this topic today and introduce the moderator. Thank you so much. Dr. Arti, I would hand over the platform to you. Just Thank mute you, everybody. And then we can... A very warm, warm welcome to Dr. Marwa El Badawi, Dr. Manoj Patel, and Dr. Alim Dhandukia, and to all the participants of today's webinar. Today's topic is dermatology. As homeopaths, we all know of its significance in our clinical practice. As the American philosopher, Gorman Howard said, always walk through life as if you have something new to learn and you will. Looking forward to an excellent insight into dermatology by Dr. Marwa El Badawi and to the experience of Dr. Manoj Patel and Dr. Alim Dhandukia in the homeopathic management of skin disorders. You're muted. Arti, you are muted by error. Dr. Arti, you are muted. I think you, you're muted. Just unmute yourself. So, one minute. I'll mute everyone and then you unmute. You're still unmuted. Dr. Arti, you're still unmuted. Now? Yes, it's fine. You yeah. can please carry on. Thank you, Dr. Ritu. A very warm welcome to Dr. Marwa El Badawi, Dr. Manoj Patel, and Dr. Alam Thandukia, and to all the participants of today's webinar. Today's topic is dermatology. As homeopaths, we all know of its significance in our clinical practice. As the American philosopher, Vernon Howard said, always walk through life as if you have something new to learn, and you will. Looking forward to an excellent insight into dermatology by Dr. Marwa El Badawi and to the experience of Dr. Manoj Patel and Dr. Alam Dhandukia in the homeopathic management of skin disorders. I now invite Dr. Rajeshri Rele as the moderator of today's session. Dr. Rajeshri Rele did her homeopathy from A.M. Sheikh Homeopathic Medical College, Belgaum. She is a gold medalist. She's on the panel for the Ministry of Health Examinations for Complementary and Alternative Medicine in the UAE. She is a recipient of the Good Services Certificate from the Ministry of Health, UAE. She has been practicing homeopathy in Dubai since 1989. Currently, she is with Good Living Medical Center. Dr. Rele, over to you. Good afternoon to everyone. I welcome you all on today's journey of learning. Thank you, Dr. Ritu, and thank you, Dr. Arti, for your kind words. Today, it is my privilege, and I'm extremely delighted to introduce today's guest speaker, the eminent dermatologist, Dr. Marwa Al Badawi. Dr. Marwa is M MSc, MD, PhD. She brings with her more than 22 years of experience in the field of dermatology, dermato-oncology, and laser medicine. She's had a distinguished career in both education and clinical practice. She has done her medical degree, residency, master's degree, MSc, as well as a medical doctorate in skin cancers and laser from Tanta University, Egypt. She's attained several certificates in the field of dermatology from Cardiff University, UK, as well as done her diploma in Dermoscopy, Queensland University, New Zealand. She relocated to Dubai in 2010 and was associated with several well-known healthcare facilities and hospitals. At present, she's the lead dermatologist at Faki University Hospital, Dubai. She specializes 
in diagnosis and management of hair nail mucous membrane disorders of pediatric adult and geriatric cases, skin cancer screening, dermoscopy, management of cutaneous melanomas and non-melanoma skin cancers, skin biopsies, intralesional injections, laser surgery, Botox injections, etc. Today, she'll be speaking on skin reaction patterns and allergy. Now, I would request Dr. Marwa to take over and enlighten us with her knowledge. Dr. Marwa, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this nice introduction. Uh, I'm glad to be with you today. And uh, I think it's a very well prepared uh, webinar that uh, we have been uh, preparing for like a couple of months uh, so far. So uh, well prepared uh, webinars are expected to um, give the benefit and give uh, the knowledge that we are looking for, inshallah. So now uh, I'm going to start my presentation. I believe you can see my screen right now. Okay. Uh, so the objectives of my presentation today is to discuss the skin reaction patterns and I will stress on two main topics that we see every day in our practice, atopic dermatitis and urticaria. Atopic dermatitis is um, uh, not easy to diagnose, uh, but there are clues for the itching, eczema, skin rash, each scratch cycle, and it's a chronic relapsing disease. The important uh, signs and symptoms that we see that it usually starts at young age. It can start from the first six months of life. There is a history of atopy in the family. IgE usually when we measure is high and there is dryness and cirrhosis of the skin. The associated manifestations include lots of atypical vascular reactions, keratosis pilaris, uh, periorbital or perioral uh, accentuation of the follicles or pigmentation. So uh, what uh, is our understanding of atopic dermatitis uh, pathophysiology over the last few years from the cavemen until today? In the 1950s, it was known that atopic dermatitis is a sort of allergy related to asthma. In 1975, it was uh, recognized that uh, the atopic dermatitis is related to uh, B and T lymphocytes. That's our understanding then. It's immune system disease. Then in the 1980s, it was known to be T-cell disease, which is more specific in the uh, immune system. In the 1994, we recognized the Th1 and Th2, and then uh, later on, now we know it's a Th2 disease affecting two helper cells. So if we look at the immune system, we have cellular and humoral immunity. The cellular immunity is composed of T lymphocytes, and the humoral immunity is composed of P lymphocytes. T lymphocytes are further uh, classified into T CD4, T helper cells, TH, or cytotoxic cells, and B lymphocytes produce immunoglobulin, and this part is related to vaccination. When we look at the T uh, helper cells, we have TH1 and TH2. In TH2, we have interleukin 4, 13, and 31. Once those interleukins are produced, they cause atopic dermatitis. This is our today understanding. So we know that uh, uh, the skin barrier function in atopic people is deficient. So organisms and uh, uh, foreign particles go through the skin, simulate the immune system to produce IL-4, 13, and 31. And this will lead to itching, and itching will lead to each scratch cycle, and each scratch cycle will lead to further itching and scratching all the time. Look at this video with me. I, it explains uh, well. It explains well what happens. Due to cracks of the skin of patients of atopic dermatitis, tiny particles from the environment around them, germs and proteins and any uh, dirt or other uh, dust particles can go through the skin. And once they pass through the uh, skin surface, they are recognized by the Langerhans cells, which is an antigen presenting cells. She takes the protein or the antigen and presents it to the T lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. And once the lymph nodes recognize it, they start to produce TH cells, TH2, and they secrete IL interleukin 4, 13, and 31. Interleukin 4, interleukin 13, and interleukin 31, they go back to the skin and produce the symptoms of itching and discomfort. And the patient starts to itch, and the itching will lead to 
more feeling of scratch-like and more, more defect in the skin surface. And this will lead to entry of more particles and the vicious circle starts. Each scratch cycle, itching and scratching, and will recruit more anti -infl more inflammatory cells like eosinophils, basophils, macrophage, and those cells secrete more cytokines, which are called inflammatory cytokines. So now we know that the itching and the scratch cycle is because of interleukin-4 and 13, which comes from uh, exposure of the skin to the antigens due to cracks on the surface of the skin, simulating Th2 cells and producing those cytokines which cause inflammation and pruritus. When we look how interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 produce their effect on the cell, interleukin-4 binds the receptor of interleukin-4 on the receptor uh, of the inflammatory cell, and this will lead to consequent protein production and formation of more molecules, more interleukin-4 and more interleukin-13 that will be formed, which stimulates more cells to secrete inflammatory uh, reactions, recruiting inflammatory cells, and irritating the nerve endings leading to itching. Itching will lead to scratching. Scratching will lead to more itching, and the patient starts the itch to scratch cycle due to stimulation of type 2 receptors with interleukin 4 and interleukin 13. What are the current treatments? Conventional treatment or herbal treatments or homeopathic treatments, they do play a very good role in controlling the disease during or between the attacks. Uh, conventional therapies with corticosteroids are not recommended because they usually it is a chronic disease, so it will lead to um, uh, side effects of the medications and immunosuppressants and biologic therapy. So the basic treatment com is composed of emollients and moisturizers, topical corticosteroids like low potency or medium or high sometimes, topical calcium urine inhibitors like Elidil and the protopic we use. Uh, Crisaborol is not available in the UEE market yet. It is a Phosphodiesterase for inhibitor that can help, that's non cortisone and can help in reduction of the itching. Sometimes we give the patient phototherapy or recommend phototherapy plus immunosuppressant medications. However, the biologic therapy, which is uh, composed of immunoglobulin, like dupinumab molecule, that's immunoglobulin sensitized by bacteria and given by injection to the patients from the age of six and above. It can bind to the receptor and it prevents interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 from binding to the receptors and producing the inflammation. So once we block the receptor with this molecule, the interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 will not cause inflammation, uh, itching, or scratching, and then we break the itch-scratch cycle by using such biologic therapy. However, this is uh, allowed from the age of six uh, and above, and it is an injectable therapy, and it needs a little bit of monitoring, and but it gives very good quality of life, reducing the itch-scratch cycle and allowing the skin to heal from the eczematized rash. So uh, when we monitor the patient as they improve with the treatment that uh, we look at the skin, we ask them about the intensity of itching and we ask them about the quality of life and uh, we can measure the quality of life by the quality of life index. Here is a patient of mine, 13 year old who had periorbital erythema and edema and eczema and he had recurrent attacks of cellulitis due to eczema around the eye. It is not a large area, but it is a life-threatening area. And this is the close-up view of the eczema. After he started dupinumab, uh, you can see almost after one month, he's almost clear with no redness or inflammation or periorbital edema or cellulitis. Another patient who had severe eczematization on the face, around the eye, neck, almost all the body was involved with the eczema. And then the patient, after two months of treatment, now you can see her smile. You can see the face is almost clear. Uh, her feeling of itch and rash is much less, and she can sleep at night. So using biologics to block the interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 receptors help to control the disease. That was the first skin reaction pattern I was going to talk about today. Do you know where this place is? This is in Dubai. This is the Dubai. sanctuary. Yeah, the sanctuary Dubai. of the birth in Ras Al Khur. It's a beautiful place. Unfortunately, it was closed during COVID-19 and we hope it will be open again soon. I go there and I enjoy uh, watching the birds and it's really relaxing and enjoying. The second topic is Articaria. 
Urticaria is a dermatological disorder characterized by sudden. All of a sudden, the patient will be sitting with you. They can have itching, swelling, and rash. Sometimes it's angioneurotic edema on the face, not only the skin, but uh, periorbital area, and the systemic symptoms also may be there. Hikes lasting less than 24 hours hours are the correct clinical characteristics of urticaria. We can see variable shapes, geographic patterns, small urticaria, large urticaria, and in COVID-19, some patients presented with urticaria as the first presentation in COVID-19 caused by the virus itself. So urticaria can be classified into acute, less than six weeks, recurrent over six weeks. But if the patient exceeds six weeks with urticaria, we call it chronic urticaria. And 50% uh, of the patients uh, progress to chronic urticaria, and this is more difficult to diagnose. Chronic urticaria is either spontaneous, we cannot find the reason, chronic spontaneous or inducible. There is a trigger like exposure to heat, exposure to cold, or other exposures like pressure and rubbing. Spontaneous urticaria most probably is uh, idiopathic. We cannot find the cause. Urticaria may be accompanied by symptoms like joint pain and swelling, sometimes headache and fatigue, flushing. The patient may present in the uh, ER with breathing difficulty or uh, abdominal pain or sometimes palpitation. They are all symptoms of urticaria. It's more common in females. The ratio is two to one. And it was found that the incidence of urticaria is increasing nowadays. We don't know why, but this has been noticed worldwide. The natural history of the disease. Urticaria is not a lifelong disease. It may last for one year and disappear two years and disappear in 30% of patients. It disappears within five years. However, in very small percentage of patients, it may last up to 25 years. So, but eventually the urticaria ends. So we have to help the patient during the attacks of urticaria, especially chronic ones. Acute urticaria, usually we use a, a strong treatment to control the episode as much as we can. Uh, the chronic spontaneous urticaria really uh, causes a burden of the disease in their daily life, eating activity, sleeping activity. They feel tired, they feel stressed and overwhelmed with anxiety. Uh, socially, they become embarrassed uh, to go to work or to uh, exercise or to the gym. Leisure will be uh, restricted. Uh, restrictions because you uh, restrict the diet of the patient and you have uh, to have self-protection, so this will lead to loneliness and anxiety and feeling unhappy. So the burden of the disease is high, uh, and we diagnose by taking proper history and proper physical examination to see the hives or angioneuritic edema. Routine diagnostic tests to, to exclude any allergy or autoimmune disease like ESR, CRP, exclude any medication that may cause this, uh, trip test test to exclude mastocytosis in chronic urticaria, uh, complement testing. We do all those tests in addition to thyroid gland. So urticaria patient may have hives only or angioedema or both. Sometimes they have both. Uh, inducible urticaria can be induced due to pressure, like dermographism, which is a phenomena that we can see in many people, skin writing phenomena, dermographism. And this is the mildest kind of urticaria, and usually it is very resistant and we cannot treat. Another kind of urticaria is cold and hot urticaria. It can be uh, checked or tested with a temp test. temp test. In the temp test, we expose the skin to temperature from uh, 4 to 44. And when we look at the reaction, the skin is reacting more to cold. So this is cold urticaria, not heat urticaria. Another kind of urticaria happens with sun exposure. Many patients on sun exposure, they develop wheels. Normally on sun exposure, there will be redness. But the swelling and the itching and the erythema around the exposure diagnosis uh, physical urticaria or uh, phototherapy urticaria or light urticaria. Delayed pressure urticaria can be tested by various degrees of pressure applied on the skin to see if there is pressure urticaria. And this usually we see in areas where the patient is wearing tight shoes or tight watch or tight ac accessories. There is another kind of urticaria which looks like tiny pin head points. And this is a cholinergic urticaria usually in young adults and usually short-lived and related to showering with hot water exercise or during exercise or in the gym. Um, and this is one of the most stubborn and resistant kinds of urticaria. How do we measure the severity of urticaria? How we classify mild, moderate, or severe? We have urticaria, UAS urticaria uh, test that we ask the patient to count the hives and give a score uh, in a daily score up to seven days per week. So UAS uh, seven weeks, uh, seven days score is composed of the number of rash 
we count them. If less than 20, we give one. 20 to 50, we give two. If more than 50, 50 we give three. And then we ask them about the itching, if it is a mild itching or moderate or severe. And then we calculate. So the score will be from zero to 42. 42 is the highest, means severe urticaria. 16 to 27 means it's a moderate urticaria. 7 to 15 means it's mild. 1 to 6 means the urticaria is under control. This is the anticardia control test. We ask the patient those four questions on therapy. If it is controlled, then uh, we will know from the anticardia control test. Uh, I do encourage you all to do the dermatology quality of life index. If you want a screenshot, this is the best screenshot you can have. Dermatology quality of life index is available in Cardiff University website, and it's available in almost all languages in the world. And um, it's only simple 10 questions you ask uh, the patient, or you give the paper to the patient to fill, and then you mark it. And once you have a number, uh, it will tell you if the patient is mildly affected, the psychological disturbances uh, uh, of the impact of the disease or severely influenced by the disease. As we know that pathogenesis of articaria means uh, erythema, edema, and inflammation. How does it happen? By stimulation of the uh, mast cells, basophils, neutrophils, and eosinophils to produce uh, uh, certain products causing vasodilatation and high hormones. How the release of histamine and other mediators is happening? It happens through activation of the cell surface by IgE. Immunoglobulin E is either available on the surface or the receptor of immunoglobulin E, or cross-linking between two immunoglobulin E on the surface. For example, IgG can bind, combine two immunoglobulin E's and lead to release of histamine, or IgG can bind to the receptor and cause release of histamine, bradykinine, and serotonin, or cross-linking with a foreign antigen directly into the surface of the mast cells will lead to release. So release of antihistamine can happen by IgG, cross-linking IgE, or directly by the receptor or directly by the antigen. Current treatment, the, uh, if we can find the trigger or the cause, we have to direct the treatment toward the cause to avoid uh, as much as we can. If we cannot find the cause, then we have to start the treatment in acute articaria. We have two guidelines. We have the American guidelines, the European guidelines, and the European guidelines. In European guidelines, we start with second generation antihistamine for two to four weeks as a monotherapy, and in the American guidelines, it is the same. If the patient did not respond in four weeks, then we increase the uh, second generation antihistamines into fourfold, uh, four times. Uh, in the uh, American guidelines, we can add um, a first generation antihistamine at night and increase the dose or add leukotriene uh, receptor antagonist. If the patient is not controlled in two to four weeks, then the third step is to give omalizumab, which is an injectable uh, biologic therapy, anti-IgE, to stop the disease. Uh, in the American guidelines, we can uh, increase, use a potent hydroxyzine, uh, potent antihistamine, then omalizumab will be step four. In the last step of the European Academy uh, uh, recommendation that we can use immunosuppressive medications to uh, com control the articaria if biologics are not working. Since when humankind started using biologic and what is a biologic? Biologic is a protein extracted or formed by bacteria under control of human being to be used for a purpose. Like the bacteria we use for baking, like the uh, bacteria we use to produce penicillin or antibiotics have been recognized since 1940s. But in the 1990s until 2018, Nobel Prize was given to many scientists due to their ability to produce protein from bacteria. They infect the bacteria with a phage virus, and the virus infects the bacteria and attacks the bacteria and uh, forces the bacteria to produce antibody that we know. So if we know that IgE, the antibody, is responsible for articaria, we produce anti-IgE. So the anti-IgE will be uh, the gene will be put on bacteria, the phage bacteria will infect, the, the, uh, the, the phage virus will infect the bacterial DNA, and then it will be given to the bacterial culture to produce the antibody. Then the antibody will be tested to see how accurate the affinity of the antibody, how accurate it, it is. So uh, during the manufacture, uh, choice of the best uh, uh, antibody to like lock and key, uh, to hold on to IgE, so then we uh, take the third generation antibodies and we uh, use it uh, for the patient. If we look at the size of the molecule of biologic, it's higher 1,000 times than the molecule of any other protein. In this video, you can see 
This is the molecule of acetyl salicylic acid, which is aspirin. And uh, you can see it's a small molecule that can be manufactured easily in the lab from chemicals. However, the immunoglobulin, when it is manufactured, the biologic, it is more than 1,000 times the size of molecule like acetyl salicylic acid, cannot be produced in the lab with, from tubes, can be produced only from bacteria under certain conditions. And it is composed of two parts, the FC part and the FEB part, which has affinity. We see which protein we want to stop, and then we manufacture the antibody to join it and to produce its effects. So it, there are different types of antibodies in the market and different biologics for different diseases, for urticaria, for atopic dermatitis, for psoriasis. There are different biologics. Each one has advantages over the other. So my message is that uh, in arteria and in atopic dermatitis, usually lab does not help much except for definition of IgE level in patients with arteria. And we don't need to monitor biologics uh, by uh, uh, using any lab test. Uh, they are easy to administer, although they are injectable and the patients are afraid in, from the beginning from dupilumab and Zolaire and the, uh, omalizumab. However, when they see the effect, they become satisfied and the, the injection uh, is either every two weeks or every one month, one month injection and we can control the disease. With this, I finish my talk and I hope you have enjoyed it and you had insight about the uh, diseases, atopic dermatitis and the urticaria as a skin reaction pattern and the old and modern treatments for urticaria. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marwa for this lovely presentation. It was awesome and very spellbound, you know, and so detailed and so extensive. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, we you have questions and answers at the end of all the three speakers. Okay, so we go on to the next speaker. Today, it is a very great pride to have a special guest today with us. The noted Dr. Manoj Patel. He's a very distinguished and a noted homeopath. He's done his MD homeopathy repertory and also is a member of the Institute of Clinical Research, MICR Mumbai. He's currently the professor and head of department of psychiatry of ML Dhawre Homeopathic PG Institute, Palghar, India. He's also a PG guide for students of psychiatry. He's, he has a research experience of being a principal investigator in diarrhea research project sponsored by Department of Ayush Government of India. He's done several paper presentations and seminars in several cities in India, also in Calgary, Toronto, and Germany. He's also an award recipient of Best Homeopathic Doctors Award year 2005 and 2006. He's a very popular and very well known for depiction of mental states and patients. So here's Dr. Manoj Patel from the reputed Dr. M. L. Dhawre, Homeopathic Institute, India. Dr. Patel, please take over. Thank you very much, Dr. Rajasri Jale, Dr. Ritu, Dr. Alem. Uh, it's my privilege, and I'm very, very happy and delighted that homeopathic fraternity in Dubai and UAE is so active, meeting together, because that's exactly how I see my progress in homeopathy is through group discussion, through interaction and sharing of knowledge. That's what I have learned in my institute, Dr. M. L. Daure. And we regularly have sessions twice in a week where brainstorming happens between all age group of different, different categories. So I think I wish well and I uh, carry a good message for all of you and a happy message from Daure Institute. And I'll share this with them for sure that how good you are doing. And today's presentation by Dr. Marwa is uh, very enlightening. I'm not here with preparation of dermatology and this, but I'll share very important insights which I have with all of you. I have 10 minutes to talk on. So I'll talk first about what Dr. Marwa has come with. It's very, very important lesson for all homeopaths to learn. Number one, the way scientific study various scales and measurements of improvement. I, I am sure so many of us are treating dermatologic conditions. 
so many of us have treated arctic area like to me arctic area we treat almost it's uh, allergy cases are bread and butter for all of us we treat it we cure it i ask all homeopath how many have documented how many can use this scale measurement and documented proof and evidence that is the only way out for homeopathy so we have to learn a lot i am very happy that we have invited doctor from modern medicine we have lot to learn from them and very frankly speaking she also shares that there are no medicines for so many things there where role of homeopathy comes up very very strongly otherwise also and why i'll tell you very important aspect since though i am in a department of psychiatry mind and skin are very closely related extremely closely related and i tell you what dermatologist in homeopathy can do job for psychiatry i have n number of cases where patients have come with mental derangement and there when i go into detail of their case history and i have found that history of skin is the key factor which was responsible because of the massive suppressions which they have gone through so mind and skin both are one is related to another in a sense of because of stress skin comes up because of number of coping mechanisms failures the skin is one of the balancing factor on another side if you suppress skin the disorders of the mental level comes up in 216 hanuman very beautifully says that homeopathy reaches beyond skull surgeon scalpel why he is saying that because the interior of human being which is disturbed he says so many psychiatric conditions are because of corporeal in origin it took a long time for me to understand this particular aphorism 215 and 216 so all student of homeopathy must stick to organon go back to hanemanian experience verify through their practice this speaks volume about case taking in each case each case even patient comes with arctic area why to take mind why to take generals why we should be holistic in nature because we will come down to history of mishandling of so many conditions which leads to psychiatric disturbance i have n number of cases today in long covid where there is lot of skin disturbance has come up and un, uh, very difficult most of the dermatologists use steroid for this situation and we have a massive role to play here i have at least helped five to six patients of mine who have come with a very massive dermatology issues post covid in which this is a part of long covid and again the detail history if every patients even simply they coming for arctic area or even for any other allergic conditions take detail account of everything you will do great service by not letting him go through a psychiatric derangement because now you take psychiatric history like where i take history and i find the whole story comes out from such suppressions so i think today's presentation has two insights which we have first research and documentations use all scale <clears throat> dr alim you are treating so many dermatologic cases i know i will request that one level each what i have learnt in mld is trust is very important tri coordinate care we call it first take care of patient community with all holistic approach second take care of learner what you are already doing in this seminar and webinar third take care of spreading knowledge what you have learned from there we can all learn together <clears throat> fourth third dimension is research hanemans homeopathy was only possible because of the well documented cases and this document allows us to do research that's what robert says in his book that if you have documented cases you will be able to help research community to do lot of research which is possible in homeopathy today i'm blessed that within a month or so i'll come with one book on uh, <clears throat> perceiving mind in homeopathic practice and fortunately all this book was possible because today's practice is very big so it is very difficult to document at that level but beginning of my practice i documented each cases with its transcript and that has allowed me to write the whole book 
So I request so many of our homeopaths have so much of wealth, but we have not documented well, not documented qualitative like what Dr. Marwa says. Use those scales which is there. We have to use same method. Similarly, assessment. Similarly, seeing changes which is possible. And I'm sure this quality practice, which I can definitely expect from UAE, I see a huge amount of qualitative involvement into practice. Wherever, whenever I have taken webinar, some or the other people from Abu Dhabi, Dubai, they are involved in listening and they come with good qualitative feedback. So it gives me brilliant idea that definitely you have a scope, you are advanced people, and you have a lot of things to contribute back to homeopathy. So thank you very much. This is a small part from me. If five minutes more, I'll share one case with you. Yes, definitely, Dr. Manoj. So, uh, we would love you I to I don't talk have video right now because I've... Yeah, I don't have video, but I'll share you a very powerful case. A man came to my practice uh, in Palgar Hospital. He was absolutely delusional. He was shouting and screaming that someone is after him and someone is going to kill him. And his behavior was so uh, uncontrollable that three doctors were not able to control this patient. And then finally, we took uh, whole details and... Uh, specifically on basis of continuously persecution that someone is following. There was a suppressed sexuality which has come up and we prescribed him Calibrome and he improved. Now the story is, this story is important now. What happened that he developed huge rashes, massive rashes all over his body after Calibrome. And we came to know that he had a leprosy and that leprosy was treated so badly by so many ointments and so many other applications that everything flared up after Calibrome. So Calibrome was given in a 30 power twice in a day. I have so many such cases, but I'm just focusing on this specifically focused on keeping our seminar topic in mind that why this is important that single dose of Calibrome started showing result on skin. And after that, I have taken again re-detail. His remedy turned out to be sulfur. Sulfur was given one dose. And this man today still reports to us without a major delusional problem and not in st started showing improvement in leprosy later on. But leprosy treatment base was different. So once we started with sulfur, his things started improving. Later on, we had to switch to bacillinum in a more repeated doses to tackle because he was not responding to so-called uh, treatment of leprosy. So then gradually we switched on to bacillinum and bacillinum started showing response to him. And today also we have to give him bacillinum to see that his leprosy because it was much uh, advanced case of leprosy is showing improvement. So again, coming back, that this live personal experience of such a massive order of delusional disorder and in background was a dermatology. In background, the care of taking care of this history. When Henneman says major psychiatric disorders are corporeal in origin, means they are based on some or the other physical conditions. By all homeopaths, by doing their, from wherever they are, even if they are doing endocrinologists, I have n number of cases that thyroid is suppressed, ending up into massive anxiety and depression. I have cases where patients' tuberculosis was suppressed, and today they are into schizophrenic outbreak. Obviously, in this, there is a model which helps all of us, is called biopsychosocial model. And these three dimensions of study should be done even for common cold. Mind, mind my word what I'm saying. For even common cold, please study family history in detail that, and past history, which will give you biological insight into patient. Second dimension which you will study is your psychological dimensions, how various stresses are affecting human being, and social dimensions, how patient is coping up with various relationships and stresses. So I think putting up all the three dimensions together will give a homeopath a complete insight into each case. 
and each case will become an academic instrument for all of us to study in detail. And again, coming back to Dr. Marwa, the way she is using all various modern technology, knowledges, research, it will help us a lot. When I'm doing as a PhD scholar, a topic which is very interesting, I'm measuring two things. What is the outcome of homeopathic interview if it is completely holistically taken and after giving similimum? And you will be surprised that so many research has happened to understand simply impact of homeopathic interview on healing. And there are scales for it. So I feel that every area, whatever you are doing, try to go, go and hunt for how people measure this cure. Don't remain and say homeopathy se ye theek ho gaya. This is cured by homeopathy. It has no value, zero value. You can show photograph also one and after and other has zero value in scientific world. You have to use approved scales. And for every disease condition, these scales are available, including emotional measurements are available, including various type of intellectual changes, which is available to be measured scientifically by third party. So I think continuously we should be in touch with Dr. Marwa and team if they are available for homeopathic research. Dr. Marwa, I'll request you to be part of the team, whoever wants to do research. And we need some third party evaluation and probably you are the best person I can see here right now with the type of uh, insight which you have into various research. Another aspect which I learned from Dr. Marwa's presentation is taking up disease protein component from bacteria which was infected by virus. So what is created by virus in bacteria and the various protein component which is extracted. I think there is a lot of homeopathy involved here. The homeopathic principles are applicable at number of fronts and a lot of autotherapy principles are very close to homeopathy. So there is a lot of uh, thing to learn from all of us. Thank you very much for giving me this time, space and respect. I don't know how much I deserve actually, but thank you. I don't want to take more than this time. Sometime, if possible, we'll come with a workshop on mental health. I'm very keen for it. That's my focused area because one in seven person needs mental health support. One in seven person. And this was 2018 survey by WHO. Today, after COVID, I can say easily one in three person needs psych mental health support. And homeopaths are champion in that. We have so much of possibilities in this and I would like to come forward with some workshop where I will invite all of you. It will be not one three hour workshop. It will be one week, three hour workshop, which will give us fairly good process of understanding mental health in each clinic. Thank you very much, Dr. Alim, for giving me your time and space. Thank you so much, Dr. Manoj. Uh, this was fantastic. These are real pearls and gems of wisdom that you've just said. And analyzing Dr. Marwa's presentation in terms of homeopathy, this was really very, very, very well said. Even if you have to, if you have a short case, which is there at the back of your mind and you are, it's there with you now, I don't mind giving you another five minutes <laughs> to say, <laughs> because this is so much learning from a guru like you. <laughs> <laughs> There are so many, but I think I would like to listen to Dr. Alim first. When we are okay. going back to question answer and when we have a time, for okay. sure I will uh, give share with quite a few experience I have. Okay. One of them I will definitely share with you. Okay, as okay. you say, that will be lovely. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you so much. This was great learning from you, no doubt. Real thank good pearls of wisdom, really. Thank you, thank you. Now it is time to introduce, and it's also my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Alim Dhandukia. He's the founder and managing director of Advanced Homeopathy India. He's at present the homeopathic practitioner at Bin Arab Dental and Medical Center, Al Riga, Dubai. He has been the ex reader and in the Department of Repertory from Dr. M. L. Dhawale Memorial Homeopathic Institute, India. He's been the ex-clinic head also of Dr. Batra's Healthcare India, as well as the Dr. Batra's International Dubai UAE. 
he uh, has done his fellowship course in homeopathic dermatology, FCHD, Dr. Batra's Academy, India. He's got a 30 years of experience in practice as well as teaching experience in homeopathy. His today's topic is atopic dermatitis and its homeopathic approach. Please, Dr. Alim, I'd like you to take over. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajeshri, for such a wonderful uh, introduction. And I must thank Dr. Ritu and her entire team, first of all, for creating such a wonderful platform for all of us where we can learn from each other and where we can share our experiences. And I would, from bottom of my heart, would thank Dr. Ritu and Dr. Uh, Srilekha for recommending me for this uh, uh, opportunity. And uh, Dr. Arvanita has always been a backbone for all of us. And she has always led us with an example of exemplary work in homeopathy for so many years in UAE. And uh, to what do I say about Dr. Manoj Patel? He is an ocean of uh, knowledge in homeopathy and we can just take few drops. It is up to us. We cannot uh, take more, you know. Uh, it is so much that uh, he has to share and to guide us for and uh, in today's presentation also I would say that in a very short time he has not only uh, analyzed Dr. Marwa's uh, presentation which was so nicely done but he has also taken us through a journey of how uh, homeopath needs to uh, record the cases as well as how it we should do a research in homeopathy. So he has given us a direction also. And uh, as far as Dr. Marwa's presentation is concerned, very beautifully in a very short time, she has given us an updated knowledge about atopic dermatitis and urticaria, not only from the pathophysiology point of view, but also from the diagnosis point of view and how to measure the treatment outcome and how to look after the other health related quality of life that gets affected in atopic dermatitis and urticaria and like skin conditions. Today, my presentation, I will be more focusing on what are the challenges as a homeopath we face. As a knowledge, we all know that it is an inflammatory autoimmune condition and it comes with a lot of uh, clinical con condition which requires a very critical analysis of the situation and a prompt action. As a homeopath, our challenge lies in therapeutics because when it comes to conventional mode of treatment, we all know that there are protocols when to prescribe anti-allergics, when to prescribe uh, corticosteroids, when to stick to local application, when is the time to go for biologics. It all depends upon the clinical presentation that we have. And this is a standardized approach applicable to all the patients. But homeopathy being an individual science or being a science of individuality or a person specific science and not a disease specific science, our challenge is there in each and every case. Every case will demand a different approach. Every case will demand a different way in which we handle the situation. I will start, share my presentation. Okay, now to start with, before going into more about the presentation or the way in which homeopathy deals, what I would emphasize on is the obstacles that we face during the treatment of any case that we are treating in homeopathy at a general level, and more particularly when it comes to treating atopic dermatitis. Now, what is so specific about challenges that we face in atopic dermatitis is managing triggers. As we all know that the most common age that is involved in atopic dermatitis is from somewhere between from six months to two years or three years. Very rarely we are approached with an adult suffering from atopic dermatitis or even if we are approached by an adult, managing that is different than managing a child 
because most of the times these children who are suffering from atopic dermatitis they are suffering from allergy to milk they are suffering from allergy to most of the proteins including nuts and non veg items they can't even have eggs they can't even have chicken they can't even have milk or they are also allergic to gluten also so you can imagine a 6 month old child suffering from atopic dermatitis and not able to drink milk also or not able to have gluten also so in that situation it is so much difficult for parents to control the child as well as we have to also look into the nutritional aspect of the child of a, because he is a growing age and if you restrict many food how that will impact the uh, nutritional part of the child of a growing age okay so managing triggers is my first challenge that i have experienced in my practice second challenge is treatment compliance the treatment compliance as we all know atopic dermatitis being a chronic relapsing condition and if not treated well there are chances that some children might continue to suffer even after they become an adult so it is important that treatment any treatment whether it is in conventional treatment or a homeopathic treatment or any other alternative treatment treatment is to be done in a way that child is reaching a level of cure and he is completely free from this condition and there is no relapse happening at least that is what is an idea of yes. homeopathy and am i audible dr rajshri yes yes you are audible yes, 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 dr kalyan yes, so Uh, when Hanuman pronounced an idea of uh, homeopathy, or when Hanuman pronounced an idea of chronic diseases, his whole idea is to achieve a cure wherever possible. Wherever illness is curable, we have to achieve that cure. Okay. So, and the most important challenge that I have experienced in the atopic dermatitis is the scarcity of characteristic data. Imagine a six-month-old child or a one-year-old child coming to us. We all know somebody's uh, mic is so not unmuted, and there's a lot of background yeah. noise that happening. Yeah. Uh, please, everybody, please mute your mics, please. Yeah. So scarcity of data is an another challenge because as a homeopath, we all know that our prescriptions are majorly, majorly depending upon our understanding of the totality, what we perceive to be a mental state of the patient, and what we perceive to be the physical uh, characteristics of the patient. Now, very beautifully, Dr. Manoj Patel sir also just now uh, uh, talked about one case where how uh, mental state. had correlation with a skin condition now when it comes to handling a children of 6 months and when we are asking to the parents what is the characteristic what characteristic we are expecting or what characteristic clinically we are getting are very very limited all that we know is child might get scared of something all that we know is child may something may be making child happy or what child is asking for most it commonly child is better by being carried by the mother or when child is alone child is scared these are the very common uh, expressions that we get and these are the very limited expressions even parents have observed in the case of a uh, child but when it comes to atopic dermatitis and if it is a condition which is very extensive i'll tell you only characteristic or only clinical presentation that we are able to see is the child is very irritable cranky child is not able to sleep child is not able to take uh, bath regularly and child is not able to eat many things because everything gets into flare ups now our success as a homeopath to be able to overcome a treatment successfully for atopic dermatitis lies majorly on how we are able to manage these challenges now as a planning part at a general level we should have a clear plan general level how we are going to manage and from homeopathic point of view how we are going to manage from general point of view there are clear guidelines in the textbook to assess the prognosis i will talk about that in the next slide but prognosis and treatment duration required has to be very clearly outlined right at the onset of the treatment when you start the treatment because 
the to one short case that I'm going to present that also will speak of that only that if parents don't continue the treatment for the required duration of the time, there can be a relapse. External skin care is extremely important. Use of proper moisturizer and use of uh, proper skin care is very important because it invariably leads to, as Dr. Marwa very nicely said, that each scratch, each cycle. That child will scratch, it will cause the damage to the skin and more allergens will Dr. Alim, you are on mute suddenly. Yeah, somebody muted me. It's okay now. Yeah. So external skin care is why important? Because we want to reduce the dryness to the maximum possible level so that unnecessary scratching doesn't happen and unnecessary skin damage does not happen, which does not further flare up the condition. Nutritional needs are to be taken care of because child are in a children are in a growing age. And if the nutritional care is not taken, it will further impact on their immune system. But when it comes to nutritional need, and if unfortunately child is allergic to gluten or child is allergic to most of the protein uh, ingredients of the food, it is a big challenge for us to how to manage the children. Role of conventional treatment, as a homeopath, we must understand what is the role of conventional treatment and how to effectively accommodate that in our management. Because many a times it happens that flare-ups are so bad that it is really challenging to bring 100% control within the strict time frame. And in that time frame, if you are not able to deliver, what who is going to suffer is the child and the parents. Okay, so I have always allowed my parents to, patients to need ways use of uh, local corticosteroid creams if the lesions are extensive and very bad because in a patient of atopic dermatitis, it is possible that different areas will have a different level of lesion severity and not all lesions are of the same intensity and same severity. So some lesions which are milder may not need a, a application of corticosteroids, but some lesions, especially on the skin folds, is sometimes so bad that you may have to allow patients to use corticosteroids as a uh, uh, simultaneous uh, treatment on a need-based basis. I always tell my patient, patient ask me that how we will come to know okay, homeopathy is working or steroid is working. So I always tell them that currently before starting treatment, if your need for corticosteroid is on a daily basis, and if after starting homeopathic treatment, if that daily base need reduces, that is an indication of homeopathy showing a positive change. Third is managing impact of atopic dermatitis on the patient as well as the parents. Because it is not only the child who is affected, it is the parents also who are affected. Imagine a house where there are uh, two or three siblings and out of two or three siblings, one child is suffering from atopic dermatitis with severe tendency to allergic reaction to many food and that child is not able to eat anything and the other child is able to enjoy everything and there is a birthday party in the house and mother is not allowing this child who is suffering from atopic dermatitis to eat a cake because mother knows that night is going to be tough if he eats the cake today. And imagine what is the stress the parents would go through in a situation like this. So as a homeopath, only coming to the remedy is not going to work. We need to have the general plan in place. Then only uh, we are able to successfully see the outcome of the case. Now in homeopathy, atopic dermatitis can demand constitutional prescription, acute prescription, intercurrent prescription, or even a prescription of a nozzle or a specific remedy. It all depends upon our perception of the totality at that particular time and what symptom totality patient is coming up with. Posology plays a very great role in management of atopic dermatitis because there are cases which will demand 30 potency, there are cases which will demand 1M potency, and there are cases which will demand LM potency also. So unless we are perceiving this very clearly managing atopic dermatitis is going to be a challenge. We can say we can say that our treatment is successful only if we are able to achieve these things. 
we should achieve a clear skin without a single patch we should achieve a quality of life without having any impact of atopic dermatitis we all know dr marwa has very beautifully give us a, given us a clue how to measure impact of atopic dermatitis on quality of life sleeplessness is the most dangerous impact of atopic dermatitis on a children because because of the intense itching and scratching child invariably has a disturbed sleep throughout the day and next morning child has to go to the school okay and this leads to the impact of quality of life on the parents also because even mother is not sleeping with the child full tolerance to all the allergic factors which child was going through before starting homeopathic treatment child should be able to achieve that he should be able to eat everything that was causing allergy only then you can say that treatment is successful by keeping the child away from all this uh, allergy causing factors and then claiming that child is better now because homeopathy is given and now he is fine that is not the definition of cure for atopic dermatitis if you are saying that the patient was allergic to gluten or if you are saying patient was allergic to milk or uh, egg you should allow the child to drink milk you should allow the child to have egg and allow the child to have gluten and then if the child is not reacting then something is done in a positive way similarly there should not be any need for any medication he should not use he should not require going forward he should not require uh, homeopathy also forget about not requiring steroids or anti allergics or biologics or immunomodulators he should not require homeopathy also if you are achieving this only then there is a possibility or th then you can claim that yes we have cured the child but if you are not able to achieve and there is no successful outcome there is nothing to fear we have always ability to review our diagnosis because sometimes it is not atopic dermatitis and sometimes it is contact dermatitis and you are thinking it as an atopic dermatitis and you are removing all the uh, food products that child is uh, allergic to and yet the skin is not settling because child is allergic to certain linen child is allergic to certain other factors which are causing contact dermatitis and that is how your treatment is not seeing the right kind of results because triggers are continuously playing the role and trust me as long as homeopathic medicines have not started uh, showing the positive result triggers needs to be kept under control but the once you see that homeopathic medicines have started helping you can start introducing the allergen challenge i call this as an allergen challenge and i do it very regularly in my practice the so once i see that patients have started feeling better and their steroid needs have reduced i change my gears and tell the parents now let's see what happens okay sometimes your diagnosis is right but your posology is wrong so many times we have seen that uh, i meet my colleagues also and i have seen patients also other doctors all telling also that why repeat constitutional before 3 months see there is a proper scientific science and proper reason based explanation given in our homeopathic textbooks on philosophy that when you will select 30 when you will select 1m when you will think of giving it in a repeated frequency and when you will give as a single dose sit and watch okay so review of posology is very important maybe your constitutional remedy or whatever remedy you have given is right but your posology is not correct that is why you are not getting the result and lastly and most importantly your remedy has to be correct sometimes what happens is those prescribers of constitutional uh, remedy or those classical prescribers who believe that we only give constitutional medicines may not experience success if the case is requiring a specific remedy at that particular time because of the scarcity of the data okay if the case is requiring in nozod as an entry point and if you stick to your approach that i am a classical prescriber and i will give constitutional only then chances are that that you might not see a good success same applies to the practitioners of the specific remedy there are people who don't believe in taking the long long cases and going into the deep analysis and they think that prescribing an acute or prescribing a, a specific remedy is all that we do and that is we have given success but trust me friends 
if atopic dermatitis case is asking for a constitutional prescription, specific prescriber will again fall short and he will only see a short term results. And dropout rates are very, very high in atopic dermatitis. The reason being that even if you have kept the patient under ambulation for six months or eight months also, it only takes one flare up which you can't manage for parents to change their mind and think that homeopathy is not working. And we cannot blame the parents because for parents, it is very difficult to see the child suffering. And when we are sleeping comfortably in our AC bedrooms, our parent, patient and their child has and the parents have had a sleepless night uh, because of a flare up. And if you can't manage that flare up, and if you can't respond on time, you only have to blame yourself and not the parents for discontinuing the treatment. So be open to review your remedy selection, be open to review, uh, review your posology selection, and be open to review your diagnostic, uh, diagnosis if you are not seeing the result. Now, going forward, just Dr. Marwa has very beautifully explained everything about uh, presentation, how clinically atopic dermatitis presents, but I would just share some of the key aspects of how an atopic dermatitis would present clinically. It acute stage, it will come up with a lot of redness, dryness, and itching, and this is how an acute presentation would look. This is an actual, present, uh, actual uh, patient uh, photograph and not a Google photograph. Second thing, it might have an subacute condition, like there will be a lot of excoriation and scaling pimples like this. This is a subacute uh, presentation. And then you may have a chronic uh, presentation where you have lichenified lesions. So atopic dermatitis can present at an acute presentation, subacute presentation, or a lichenified presentation. Okay. Usually in pattern, all three forms can coexist together in the same patient. The same patient can have a lichenified lesion. At the same time, he can have episodes of subacute flare-up or an acute flare-up, depending upon the trigger. And this is the real challenge as a homeopath, the when to use constitutional, when to use acute, when to use what potency and in what frequency and repetition. Skin dryness is common in all the three stages, whether it is acute, subacute, or uh, chronic. Skin dryness is very common. And during early age, infancy age, you see more of an acute pattern. But as the children grow, the lesion starts becoming lichenified. Now, prognosis, as I was talking about, we need to discuss the prognosis right at the start of the treatment. The AD, if it is a widespread AD and the uh, uh, lesions are all over the place for the child, or there is an allergic rhinitis or asthma associated, prognosis is not good. If there is a strong family history, or if there is an early onset, if the child has started suffering right from the second or third month or sixth month of age, prognosis is not good. And being an only child or a very high Ig level, these are a some of the criteria which will indicate that prognosis is not good. Now, why do we want to think on this is that on what ground you will tell the parents that prognosis, what is likely prognosis, and why do you want your child to continue homeopathy for a particular duration of time is based on your scientific reasoning. And if you are able to give that scientific reasoning to the parents, parents will trust you better and they will understand that this homeopath understands the disease well and what he's talking makes sense. So it is always better to be very open with the factors that may influence the treatment outcome and discuss that with the parents right at the beginning of the treatment. Now, Dr. Marwa also spoke about assessment. Dr. Manoj Patel, sir, also spoke about objective assessment. Now, here we can see that severity assessment is definitely based on certain fixed criteria. Clear skin, no impact on the quality of life, no evidence of any active lesion, normal skin is our ultimate goal that we want to achieve. Okay, but you can have a patient coming to you with a mild impact, moderate impact or severe impact. As you go higher in the impact, you will see more impact on the quality of life. At the same time, skin lesions are more bad. There are cracks, there is bleeding, there is oozing, there is itching, 
there is flaking and the child is not sleeping child is not able to enjoy active uh, life with normal functioning of the children going to play going to school attending school, extracurricular activities all these things gets affected now here if you see the blue arrows are what is going to indicate the disease aggravation there are so many times i have seen that patient come to us and they tell that you are going for a homeopathic treatment to so and so doctor and when we after starting the treatment there was a lot of increase happening in the complaint and doctor homeopathic that homeopathic doctor kept on telling that wo pehle bahar aayega homeopathic doctor says that it is bringing out the disease but actually that is very wrong concept it is if you experience that the uh, intensity is increasing from mild to moderate to severe patient is traveling from the blue area direction or blue arrow direction there is a disease aggravation and you we need to rethink about our remedy and posology okay if things are direct going in the direction of green arrow then we are saying that it is a direction for cure and that is our objective first patient who is is coming to you at a mild or a moderate level will take time to go to clear skin he will travel from severity to moderate level moderate level to milder level and milder level to achieving a clear skin this is a process which will take time depending upon how much damage has happened on the skin if there is a lichenified skin already developed widespread all the all the flexures and extensor surfaces then you have to tell the patient that it is a matter of not one or two months but in one or two years that you will be able to achieve the change but for us to understand this process and direction of cure and direction of disease aggression is very important so that we can right time have a right assessment now this is in general what we need to do as a homeopath i would quickly now take you through one case and we'll discuss what challenges we as a homeopath face and how we can overcome these challenges this is a case of three year old child who has started suffering from atopic dermatitis right from the age of 6 months i have treated this child when he was 6 month old and when he first time started suffering from atopic dermatitis that time he was allergic to mother's uh, milk because the whenever mother ate uh, egg or mother ate some protein based thing and a child was on breastfeed and child would react so it was not only causing difficulty for the child but it was causing difficulty for the mother also to what to eat and what not to eat sleeplessness irritability quarrelsomeness were the usual symptoms experienced by the patient that time the from the assessment of the behavior of the because it was 6 month old child hardly as i told you scarcity of data is always a challenge in homeopathy for this age group so that time upon the behavior of the child and upon the uh, other uh, indications pulsatilla was given to the child and child fabulously responded in reducing the intensity of the of the disease not cure the disease i spoke about the problem second challenge that we face about compliance parents said that after one year of treatment and child was better he was hardly showing mild reactions to anything so they stopped the treatment for one year they completely stopped the treatment and child was fine also we were in regular touch and child was fine also so they thought it is not required to give the treatment again but in last one year child has again come up with a severe flare up severe flare up so much so that you will see when i share the photos of of the child that there was a severe flare up that child was showing and now again they have approached us for the treatment and this is all the data what we are getting is sleeplessness irritability quarrelsome and always asking for food he is allergic to citrus fruit dairy gluten eggs nuts seafood meat and chicken can you imagine now what is left for the child to eat and how not ability to eat this how it is impacting the child we can see now as far as the characteristic aspect or a physical level indications are concerned child is hot and his appetite is increased is always asking for food mother's pregnancy history mother has allergic cough throughout the pregnancy and older brother has allergic rhinitis now by all means whatever we have studied as criteria for assessing prognosis you can say the child is meeting all the criteria of prognosis which is indicating that the prognosis is bad 
uh, child has started suffering from very early age, six months of uh, age. There is a widespread area affected all over the body, and there is a family history of allergic rhinitis, which is indicating that the prognosis is bad. Okay. Now, as far as the mental state or a life space investigation is concerned, mother gets very loud when she sees the child crying or scratching too much. It causes stress to mother. Remember, I spoke about how the atopic dermatitis impacts the parents. Now, as far as the child is concerned, child is obstinate, obstinate and demanding so much so that he wants things to be done as he says. If he wants his mother to switch off the light and mother asks brother to do it, child will be upset. Child is always very irritable, cranky, okay? And child likes to eat various food. And he enjoys whenever mother allows him to eat. But unfortunately, what mother has to do, mother has to lock the fridge when she sleeps because when the parents are sleeping, child will secretly open the fridge and eat whatever you he wants to eat. The reason is when the parents are around, they will not allow the child to eat. Can you imagine the situation of the parents how, heartly, how heavy heartedly they will have to lock the fridge when they go to sleep. And can you imagine the condition of the child who waits for the parents to go to sleep so that he can go and eat? How much is the deprivation from the child and how much is the deprivation that parents have to do for not leading to the flare-ups? Otherwise, child is an organized child. He likes the cabinet's door not left open. If somebody has left the cabinet door open, he will point out. If somebody has left the bathroom light on, he will point out. He likes to park his cars in an order. So this is maximum possible data available in this case. Despite of talking to the parents once in 15 days and trying to understand what more is about the child's characteristics. Now, as Dr. Manoj sir rightly pointed, that there are so many skin uh, conditions deteriorated during COVID time. Now, we don't know whether in this case that has played a role, but this is the observation of mother that because of the COVID, child is not able to go to the play area and child is confined to home. So, this is a flare. So, can you imagine not able to go to play, not able to eat the food that you want? Now, in the child's life, what else is there? You eat and you play. These are the two things and our patient is deprived of both. Okay, now, as I told you, we've started the treatment in this year, January, because there was a flare-up again for last one year. There is a flare-up and because of COVID and all, they didn't want to come to clinic and uh, take a treatment. So they were somehow managing with steroids and other things. And from January to May, this is the situation. That we keep getting this type of photographs as a follow up from the parents on my mobile. That this is the situation. Can you see the different ways in which the therapies are happening? You can see the subacute uh, stage of uh, flaky dermatitis that is happening on the hand, or you can see a erythematous rash that is happening on the skin all over. In dryness, you can see the dryness on the hair also, not only on the body, but you can see how the hair has also become dry. This is the situation in last five months of treatment till May. Okay. And what treatment we have given? We have started the case with Pulsatilla because child had responded extremely well to Pulsatilla. Okay. Now, after studying the case, there was not much more new data to prescribe or indicate very glaringly and another remedy. Pulsatilla had responded, so we had started with Pulsatilla. During the acute flare-ups when child is becoming so cranky, so irritable, we have given chamomilla, we have given Sina. We have also given lycopodium and sulfur. Why have we given lycopodium and sulfur? Because of the constitutional nature of the child being an organized child, being a demanding child and wanting to do whatever he wants or wanting people to do whatever he wants. Now, out of this, what do you think? What may have worked for the child? Any guesses? Can anybody from the life space, what we have discussed and from the data that we have presented? Sulfur. Okay. Interesting. Anybody? Could also be Cal iode or so, right? Yes, possibly. Sulfur also. Yes, 
Then can we think of anything else apart from calcare iodine and sulfur? How about graphite? Yes, possibly. Okay, now from the totality that we have, pulsatilla, chamomilla, sina, and lycopodium we have given, and what has worked? Nothing has worked. Nothing has worked. Lycopodium has not worked as a constitutional prescription. Sulfur has not worked as a constitutional prescription. Pulsatilla, which worked earlier, has not worked. Chamomilla has not worked. Sina has not worked. Now imagine what is the situation. They are simultaneously consulting dermatologists also. And dermatologist is also now uh, tired because steroids are also not working. And now the child is suggested to start with biologics. They have suggested the child should be given protopics. Because mother was in constant touch with me, whatever development happens from dermatologist consultation also, she would always ask me before doing anything because somewhere she firmly believed that I will guide her. Even if I'm not able to treat her, at least I will guide her right. So I usually, in my practice, whenever I'm treating a case of atopic dermatitis or wherever I'm treating any case autoimmune condition, which is going to the need for biologics or immunomodulators, I myself don't prefer. I allow selective use of corticosteroids to be applied topically, need ways that too, but be it psoriasis, be it atopic dermatitis, I do not encourage to use protopics. And there is a valid reason for me to do that because I know when I firmly believe that if I work very strongly on the case and if I come to the right remedy in homeopathy, my patient will not travel from a need for steroids to biologics. That is my firm belief. So it all indicates me that I'm going wrong. It does not indicate me that something is going wrong with the patient. But when my patient of atopic dermatitis starts uh, showing an indication for protopics, I feel that what I am doing is wrong and I need to correct that. Now, friends, this is my situation. I'm going to present my actual situation in this case that I don't know what I should do more. I am not able to get any characteristic data, which is a obstacle number one in this case for me. And I've tried my best to ask parents and every time I connect with the patient, mother only says, doctor is not better, is only better when he's applying steroid and he's not able to eat that and he's not able to eat this. My situation is like this. And obstacle number one, which I spoke about is scarcity of characteristics data. Who will rescue a homeopath in this situation is the question. Okay, and why? I always my answer to myself is only homeopathy can help a homeopath and nobody else can help a homeopath. But in this situation, we, as a homeopath, we have already done whatever we had to do. Now what homeopathy more we can do and what homeopathy can help further is the question. Now this is whenever you are in trouble in homeopathy, it is always a wise thing to go to certain concepts in homeopathy. Now as a logic, Dr. Kent writes in lesser writings that a prescription, successful prescription depends upon the view taken of the totality. Understand this statement very well that so far, whatever we have done in this case, we have not taken an accurate view of the totality. Okay, that is why whatever prescriptions we have done has failed. Pulsatilla worked that time, maybe it was a partial view that we had taken of totality and we were lucky enough to get some response, but this time we are not lucky. So what view we will take of the totality will determine the success and failure, okay? Same thing, one more concept, Dr. Kasad writes in ICR Symposium volume. He says the symptom should always have precedence over the type as the criteria for prescribing as they furnish the different forms of evidence. What statement or what does this statement mean that we are, see after, 15, 20 years of practice in homeopathy, it is by default our tendency and not wrong also that we are able to easily come to understanding whether it is a calcarea patient or whether it is a sulfur patient or it is a lycopodium patient. And 90% of the time we are not wrong also because we have seen so many times and it, it is easy now. It, nowadays because things are after experience, even if you talk to your 
friend also for 10 minutes back of mind you are thinking what type it is so thinking of patient type and coming to a typological prescription what dr kasat talks about in icr symposium volume okay, what is a typological prescription is what we are regularly doing it and we are doing it with uh, reasonable success also but believe me friends i am telling you this from my experience that whenever your typological prescription fails even after 30 years of experience in homeopathy if you fail to come to a remedy from the typological prescription that means that the case sitting in front of you is asking for a remedy which you yet don't know in your career otherwise you will not fail you will only fail if the case is asking for a remedy which you yourself don't know we all homeopaths have a different level of understanding of Matra Medica and uh, there are a list of remedies we are familiar to and there are a list of remedies we are not yet familiar about. So it all depends upon that. If you are familiar, it, if I know a case sitting in front of me indicating clearly a Calcarea Carbonica, I will not bother myself to sit and form a totality and repertorize and then give the prescription. Okay, but what Dr. Kasat says is that symptoms always precedence over the type. That means that symptoms in the case should indicate the way forward in the totality, not our assumptions of types. But in this case, there are no symptoms. There are what view more we can take of the totality is the issue. Okay, but it will be wise to now as a repertory student or as a repertory teacher, I love to talk about this concept because it is very central to constructing a totality. And without this concept, you cannot construct a successful totality. Now, understand this, what makes a symptom characteristic in homeopathy? Okay, unusual association. Example of unusual association, I will say is coated, thick coated tongue and extreme drowsiness in case of antim tart. It is an unusual association which you cannot logically explain that why even in a simple, not in an advanced case of pneumonia, but even in a simple mild cold and cough also, you will see that the child is presenting with extreme uh, drowsiness and there is a coated or coating tongue. So this makes the symptom characteristic and unusual association. Next comes is your unusual modality. Now, joint pains of Rustox feeling better by motion is an unusual modality. Okay, so some such modalities which are not explained clinically or which are contrary to what is expected by the patient will make that symptom characteristic. Now, more and most important is unusual intensity. Now, here in this case of atopic dermatitis, we will learn how this understanding of unusual intensity has come into play. It so happens one day that I am scheduled for a regular follow-up with the patient. I am sending the Zoom link to the patient and mother is uh, joining the Zoom, but child is extremely cranky and irritable. And uh, it was so much irritable that I had to call it off. And I had to tell the parents that first settle the child and we'll connect again. After half an, half an hour, 45 minutes, uh, parents are again uh, sending a message that yes, child is now quiet and we are connecting. So when we connected, child was uh, nicely sitting on mother's lap and he was eating something from this bowl. And mother was giving the feedback that doctor is not better, skin is not better, and all that routine, whatever she talks, it was shown to me. But then I said, what was the reason why he was so upset? So she said that he was asking for food. I said, then you should have given him food and then connected. Why did you connect it and keeping him hungry? So mother said, no, I've just given him food before one hour. And he's still asking for like this. And whenever uh, I tell him that I will give him a food at one o'clock, child will keep looking at the clock and waiting for the one o'clock to happen until that time, he will be like this only cranky and restless. This struck me that this is something characteristic in terms of intensity. Nothing, no other data changes except this one data, always asking for food. And it is not only simple asking for food, but it is followed by a compulsive behavior of eating. Now, my next step was how to find the relevance for this particular symptom in Matra Medica. Where to find a remedy was a challenge to me. Okay, so as a, again, I would say as a repertory student, 
what we need to do is a clinical symptom. We need to find relevance in the proving symptom. And only thing we are able to do it with crossing this bridge. And this bridge, all of you know, is a bridge of repertory. So unless you cross this bridge, there is no chance that we can find some relevance in our Matra Medica. So what I did, I opened the Matra Medica or repertory and searched for the phenomenon which our patient was going through. Here is the rubrics that I've taken. Mother said that he's better when child is carried and taken to lab, child is better. And when child is eating, child is better. So when we are seeing in stomach appetite constant, another rubric is appetite increase, hunger in general, eat frequently must. And there is eating must. Now, when we are doing this repertorization, there is a first remedy coming, which in my 30 years of experience, neither I have heard about, nor I have seen any of my colleagues or any of my teachers or any webinars, any seminars or any literatures where this remedy was even mentioned. I was so uh, uh, unfamiliar with this remedy that I was not even knowing the full form of this remedy. Okay, I don't know. Does anybody know what is the full form of this remedy? No. So can you allow people to share? Does anybody know the full form of this remedy? Is it Taraxica? Texas Bacata? Yes, it is Texas Bacata. It is not Taraxica, it is Texas Bacata. Okay, now because this symptom is three grade in the repertory, it indicates that this is a proving symptom and this proving symptom has been mentioned in our source book. If it was the latest proving, which was not mentioned in our source book or which was not well proved, it would have come as a one mark symptom. But because repertory is mentioning it as a th three marks, it indicates that it is a proving symptom. Now, what I have done is to make sure and to know more about this remedy, I'm going to Matra Medica. And to my surprise in Clark, what we are seeing is very beautiful. The symptoms of pathogenesis are made up of poisonings of by leaves and berries and provings by Dr. Gastier. Empty filling in the stomach was prominent and it was noted that the digestion was very rapid. Must eat frequently is the characteristic. Remember this. And going, when we are reading further, it is also indicating that it has an affinity towards skin affections. So to some extent, I was getting little convinced that there is a concomitant showing in the case and there is an affinity to the skin also showing in the case. I refer to Boric, even Boric mentions that emptiness must eat frequently. Now, Dr. Manoj sir very beautifully said that homeopathy has to be a research-based thing and there has to be a very well-documented cases and we need to really show to the world that homeopathy is a scientific thing with our process and documentation. Imagine homeopathy process of documentation and scientific research that has gone in homeopathy, not now, but in 1835. Dr. Gastier in 1835 mentions about how Texas Bacata was proved, how many drops, how many days, how many doses, when it was taken, who has taken, who are the provers, everything Dr. Gastier mentions in his proving, which Dr. T. F. Allen in his Endless Encyclopedia records as it is without any manipulation. So research in homeopathy is not today. Research in homeopathy is right from the time it is originated, right from the time of its inception. Homeopathy is based on research. When we read further in uh, Allen's Encyclopedia, very beautifully, not only it is mentioned about the need for frequent eating, but it also describes very beautifully everything that is happening with an atopic dermatitis patient. Dr. Allen, the, at a, yeah, at a skin level. We are done. Okay. Now we see in uh, Wikipedia also uh, the same thing. What is mentioned about allergy producing factors about Texas Bacata, and this is what we see as a child responded to the treatment. I, I don't know how much it is. I don't know how much it is audible, but we can see that the skin has improved, the hair has improved, and 
legions have gone can anybody hear is it audible not really no okay. no yeah so we go ahead with the next slide just uh, slide no case presentation this is so this is another case which we have treated with uh, extensive lichenification and different uh, uh, stages of uh, skin affecting it's a long case but here is even if you don't can't hear you can see the change that has happened in the child you can see the extensive lichenification you can see the flare ups in between the case during the treatment flare ups You can see the pustules with secondary infection. You can see how the lichenification has disappeared, how the clear skin is achieved, and patient is not on any medication now. Would you like to share the medicines? Yes, yes. See, the management, it's a very long case, but constitutional prescription was sulfur and calcarea carb. Intercurrent use was tuberculinum and acute use was pulsatilla and arsenic. It's a long case, so we cannot go into more detail, but uh, these are the experiences that if your totality is right, if your remedy understanding is right, if your posology is right, and if your general management is right, Atopic dermatitis is 100% curable condition in homeopathy without any further relapses and child can absolutely live a normal life for the rest of the uh, life without uh, having to suffer further with any other because you know, natural course of atopic dermatitis, it is said that at least 70% of the patients tend to develop respiratory complaints when they grow up or they tend to develop contact dermatitis when they grow up. When the atopic dermatitis is the history of childhood, as an adult, you may suffer from contact dermatitis or respiratory allergies. But if the early work is done in a successful way, these things also can be avoided. But all that I would say is that together we win against chronic diseases, which is the purpose of homeopathy, which Dr. Hanuman has come up and taught us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alim. This was really very good, uh, especially a case of Texas Bacata. I mean, coming to the coming to the PQRS symptom, the characteristic symptom, to come to the actual remedy, you know, which gives the actual cure. Because we do come across so many remedies which helps partially, but to give a total cure and present a case like this is hard because uh, the challenges that we face in homeopathy, I mean, even that, otherwise, but all doctors is the pruritus, parents not sleeping, children not sleeping, uh, patients changing doctors from time to time, not sticking to one doctor. So the doctor also doesn't have enough time to deal with the PQRS symptoms because very often the characteristic symptom is not really thrown at you. You know, it comes over the time. That's what. And uh, this second case of lichenification was also very superbly done. 
Congratulations to you. That was really thank you, good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. There don't seem to be any queries or questions for the doctors somehow. Yeah. If there uh, is anything, please, I would like to answer. Yeah, uh, there don't seem to be any queries. So uh, would Dr. Manoj Patel would like to speak for five minutes? Because he said, he mentioned that earlier. Yes. Yeah, but someone, if has question, I think it will be far more better to answer. Any question to all of us? I would request uh, all participants to please put questions in chat box or raise their hands if they have any queries. Because so that uh, we can answer. question will really help us. Right. Chat, chat, chat box me liko. I think everybody is very clear with the explanation of. Uh, all the speakers that there are no queries as such. Dr. Deepak, I think he's raised his hand. Dr. Rashtri, I think Dr. Deepak, you can unmute yourself. I can see him. Dr. Deepak, you can unmute yourself and then ask the question. And Dr. Rashtri, uh, there is Dr. Halloween also who's put a question yeah, in the chat there box. There is a question so, Dr. Halloween puts that why sulfur and lycopodium? The, it, uh, it was a constitutional prescription based on the characteristics thrown by the patient, but because it is a case of three-year-old where cyclically calcarea and sulfur were used, uh, it will be better that we have a separate uh, uh, opportunity to uh, learn this case further, but it will be very difficult to give the more details at uh, this platform in the short time. Someone's asked, have you treated alopecia? Yes, alopecia areata in autopic derby, again an autoimmune disease, and homeopathy gives wonderful results in alopecia areata, and that is 100% recovery and preventing of relapse with homeopathy. Dr. Deepak is not able to unmute, he says. Yeah. And Dr. Deepak, can you just unmute yourself? Because... Host has to allow his writing. No, but uh, everybody is allowed to unmute. I am allowed to unmute. I don't think it should be an issue. Because no everybody else. Okay. okay. Let me just check. Yes, Dr. Marwa, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, regarding alopecia areata or regarding eczema? Both, either. Uh, alopecia areata is really difficult to treat, especially if it is alopecia totalis. Uh, however, um, in case of failure of all conventional therapy, like uh, systemic corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, and phototherapy, I think homeopathy comes next. Um, to be honest, there is a new medication uh, called JAK inhibitor in the market, but I cannot say it is safe to use for alopecia areata. It is not clear the new AE yet. It's allowed mm -hmm. by FDA and allowed in the US, but not the new AE yet. So after failure of conventional therapy, uh, the only hope for the patient is homeopathy so far uh, until we have an approved line of treatment. So good to hear that from you, Dr. Marba. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And I'm sure quite a few practitioners have had good responses with alopecia areata especially, if not universalis. But with alopecia areata, we definitely uh, have a lot of good results, no doubt. Um, so sure. to summarize, uh, I feel um, uh, today's on the highway of learning and knowledge. I think each one is, of us is taking back some tips, you know, such knowledgeable tips from Dr. Marwa, uh, Dr. Manoj Patel, his insight into uh, looking into things and collecting evidence um, and putting things in order. I mean, having your measures of how much is the patient getting better and giving his insight was really fabulous. And so also Dr. Alim's cases were really very good, no doubt. Thank you so much, all of you, uh, all you speakers Dr. as well Rashi, as the audience. Dr. Yes. Ashri, before we proceed, I think there are questions. Dr. Deepak has 
put the yeah, question in the like chat to, box. I would like to I would like to answer those questions. Yeah, there are a few first questions all, which Dr. we can. First of all, Doctor Deepak is asking me okay, why have I not taken glutony uh, as a uh, rubric for uh, this case. I would like to answer him that I had to go and go to the Google and understand the word meaning glutony. So you can understand why I did not take glutony. I took what I saw in the case that appetite increased and he must eat and frequently asking for food, which was very well depicted as a three mark indication for Texas Bacata. So that was serving the purpose. And a second thing, he is asking if I used any tinctures. No, nothing was used. Only Texas Bacata is used and nothing else is used. And now the child is off steroids last three months. I would add only small dimension to all what we are discussing is do not forget miasm. Yes. A lot of people are asking question about alopecia. And most important dynamics is that every disease condition Please try to assess miasmatic background. Your result sometimes fails because you have not assessed miasmatic background properly. And many a time I have seen in syphilitic miasm when the alopecia is there or when in tubercular miasm or when it is in psychotic. The type of treatment, sociology differs. So everyone has to take care of assessing miasm. Probably their results will improve. Very true, Dr. Manoj, uh, because when he mentioned, when Dr. Alim mentioned about acute, subacute, and chronic, it was very evident it was sora psychosis and syphilis, the way he had perfect. put it up. Perfect. Very, very perfectly put up. And all these uh, uh, cases were very challenging. I must congratulate him that he has, has learned a lot to handle all this situation and must present much more in frequency. Very. Thank you, sir. It is a privilege to present in your presence and demonstrate what we have learned from you. <laughs> please, please. I think this is beyond us. Even I have not treated such challenging situation. So it's Dr. really good. Dr. Kamil has raised his hand. Yes, if I allow, I would like to ask a question to Dr. Alim. Basically, yes, I'm not a physician. I would like to clear at this junction. But since I did research on many, many plants, uh, you have mentioned about Texas Bacata. And what dose you give to the child? Sir, I started, see, first of all, the challenge was if you read, if you have paid attention to the date on which the repetition was done was May. And May was the time where the world was going through a second flare up, second wave in COVID. And uh, getting Texas Bacata was the uh, first uh, struggle because enough trial and error was already done in the case and getting Texas Bacata was a challenge in itself. So mm -hmm. what we had to do is we had to arrange a, a Texas Bacata from Pune to somebody traveling by a chartered flight from Mumbai to Dubai. So we had to ask somebody to deliver Texas Bacata from Pune to mm -hmm. Mumbai and bring it in the chartered flight from uh, Mumbai to Dubai. And that time I was not driving, I was not having license. So I am staying in Nada, and the person who came to Dubai, he came and stayed in Jumeirah. So I had to spend 100 dirhams of taxi to go and collect the medicine from him. Okay. So, so what potency you gave? I gave 30. Huh. I, I, I acquired 30 and 200 both, but I started the case with 30 on a weekly repetition. But in my experience, if your remedy is right, potency is cautiously given, then it doesn't matter much. But immediately within three to four weeks, we started seeing the child slightly started settling down. So then we stepped up the potency from 30 once a week to three days. Now currently, child is on 30 BD. I basically, uh, I asked this question that Texas Bacata, the English U, is so poisonous that it causes the cardiac arrhythmia. And absolutely. in some cases, even it has been found a 59 year old man was admitted to the hospital yes. and he was died due to that. See that is so that that's is why the, I asked the dose. See that is the beauty of homeopathy that in I Wikipedia, know, in I Wikipedia, know. if you see, they are mentioning the poisonous effect of Texas Bacata even at a local level in the skin. That is why they are recommending that the plant should be touched with gloves. That means that Texas Bacata is potentially.
causing atopic dermatitis, but homeopathy is able to cure atopic dermatitis with texel butter. That's very good. That is a similar similar experiment. And uh, Dr. Ashok, what is your experience with 50 millisimal? I am not sure how much it is available in UAE. No, no, no. Sir, here Dr. it is not so much available. Here, maximum available is 30 and 200. Even if it is, we want to give 1 M, we have to arrange it. I think you, all of collectively, all homeopaths should come forward because skin conditions and so many conditions, reputation yes. with 50 millisimal is yes. far Especially more psoriasis. effective and less harmful. Especially psoriasis responds very well to LM potencies. Perfect, perfect. It's so, time now, approximately yeah. almost coming to four. Thank you so much, Dr. Marwa, Dr. Alim, Dr. Manoj Patel for a fantastic afternoon. It was great learning from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. And Dr. Manoj Patel, we would love to hear from you again on a later on date and much more in detail. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. We will go into mental health where I have done a lot of work. So for sure, it is my purpose taking yes. message of my learning to all. So someday we will have full length, one and a half hour or so for uh, mental health only. Sure. And I'll be I there. Sorry. We'll be there for you. Lovely. I, I, would, I, would, I would like to thank I would like to thank a lot of my colleagues who have joined from different uh, cities of India as well as different countries like Malaysia and Slovakia also to attend this webinar. And I must thank them for taking time out for attending the session. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Arti to take over. Dr. Arti? Before Dr. Arti takes over, whatever queries which are unanswered, I would request them to please send a message uh, to probably me or doc, whosoever is the speaker to ask on a personal basis because now I think we finished with the time so we'll not cater to more questions and we'll just go for a vote of thanks. Dr. Arti, you can please take over. Thank you. Thank you very much Dr. Marwa Albadavi for the excellent presentation on atopic dermatitis and urticaria and for sharing the information on the qualitative index and enriching us with your wealth of knowledge and experience. Thank you, Dr. Manoj Patel for, the, for sharing the fantastic short case and for the gemstones on case taking. Looking forward to your book on perceiving mind in homeopathy. We always look forward to such great learning sessions from stalwarts like you. Thank you, Dr. Alam for sharing such interesting cases and fantastic results and it was great learning about Taxis Bakata from you. Thank you, Dr. Ritu, for always ceaselessly coordinating these sessions. Your enthusiasm is always infectious. Thank you to all those who tirelessly work towards putting together these learning platforms. And thank you to all the participants who made this session a success. Thank Over you so to you, Dr. Ritu. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Arti, for the lovely vote of thanks. And I thank uh, everyone, all the speakers, to be here on this platform. I think with this, we will wind up the session. We will look forward to uh, Dr. Patel's, I think, webinar series or the course that he's talking about. I think we all would be very much keen on that. So Perfect. let's hope it comes out soon and yeah. we attend that shortly. Thank you so much. For the, and uh, then... For the next announcements, it would be again, I think next month, third week or Wednesday, that will be the next uh, webinar. So we'll update you shortly in the group. Thank you all for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay.